Welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today we dive back into the depths of Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape from Cool Mini or Not. If you haven't checked out any of the videos in my series for this one, I'll put a link to the entire thing in the top right hand corner. Now we dive into a larger one shot scenario by popular demand from the comments in the prior videos. It was very apparent that everyone wanted to see a bigger and larger scenario so the game had time to really get going. The tutorial was quite short, helped with learning the game but now we're ready to see if we can take on what is going on in the depths of this dungeon now there's a couple changes going into this one first off you'll notice that the map layout is larger there are more miniatures laying around that represent different things like traps and wells and chests and all that kind of stuff so i'm using a little bit more of what was offered from the crowdfunding campaign in terms of additional content and also it's worth mentioning it was of interest to see another character added in so what i've done is from the two characters I had in the prior video, which was the wizard Mathrin, and we had the paladin Sir Ronan. I've taken Sir Ronan out of the equation as we heavily used the paladin in the tutorial scenario, even though it was quite short, and we substituted in, thanks to a voting done by my patrons on Patreon, it is going to be a rogue joining us on this journey with the original wizard. We weren't able to see everything the wizard had to offer, but now you're going to get to see two additional classes kind of a little bit more flushed out as we walk through this scenario together and hopefully end up coming out the other side of it with a victory. So without further ado, let's dig into how you set up the rogue character, talk a little high level about it, then we'll find out about our quest and dive into the depths. The individual that has joined us is Phaedra, and I'm going to call her Faye throughout the entirety of the playthrough for short. I've chosen the short bow for this rogue, as it will be nice to have that ranged option available, as well as melee. And of course, the battered leather armor that every character gets standard in one-shot scenarios. You can also see special abilities for Faye listed out, as well as mana and health to start. The rogue class is very different than the wizard or the paladin in terms of using boards to represent their classes. The rogue uses a drawstring bag, and inside that bag from the very beginning you're going to grab a number of tokens, nine of them to be exact, and they're going to have a darkened or blackened background behind the icons, and you're going to want to place those nine tokens inside the bag to start. The rest of this pool will sit off to the side and may be placed inside the game bag as you level up, depending on the skills you choose from your level ups. The nine starting tokens are now inside the Rogue's Thieving Tools bag, and we're now going to look at these level one cards I've laid out. We get to choose one of them to start things off, and as you can see right on the cards, whatever we choose in terms of this level one level up, we're going to be gaining some tokens from the pool below to place inside the bag. Out of the three level one cards I have to select, I'm going to go with the Tailored Swiftness card, which is going to have me add this token here, which allows me to draw a token after this action, and another token here, which is a plus two movement into the Thieving Tools bag. The rogue is now set up and ready to go. Let's talk quickly about how the rogue activates and uses the thieving tools bag. So when the rogue does activate, just like every hero always gets three actions to use, and what will happen at the exact same time as activations, you're gonna draw three tokens out of the rogue drawstring bag. You'll place them in front of you, front side up, so you can see what each of those different bonuses are. In this case, you can see a shadow, a plus one orange die, or a plus two movement point. Then you're gonna strategize on how you're going to go about your actions like you do with every hero but with the rogue it's interesting because every time you take an action you must flip over and use one of these tokens regardless of whether or not the action you take actually can be benefited by the token or not so in other words if you choose to just do three actions of moving you could potentially do your first action of moving and move your regular allotment of just two movement points then go ahead and flip over a token like this one here in order to gain two more movement points 
So now you've moved four with one action. Then you go into the next action, you decide, well, I still want to move. Now you're kind of not using the tokens in front of you to their best abilities. So you go ahead with your second move action, and then you'd be forced to flip over a token, but not be able to take advantage of the benefits. So therein lies a strategy of, do you use the benefits presented from the thieving tools bag in sync with the actions you're taking, or do you kind of go off on your own and do what you need to do regardless of what comes in the bag? This is what makes the Rogue really unique and can lay out some pretty insane combinations. Now, I think a lot of you will remember that in the prior play that I did with the tutorial, there was a Shadowbane armor piece that we picked up during that play, and it was just one piece of a set that you can collect. You can see here for each of the classes inside the game, there's a reference card here, whether it's for the wizard, the rogue, or whatever class you are actually using, that will let you know of additional bonuses you'll receive depending on how many of those Shadowbane set pieces you collect. You'll see at the top, if you happen to have two or more set pieces you gain the top ability and if you have the bottom one of four plus you gain the bottom ability so there is a lot here to add on top of what you already have if you like to collect a set of a particular type of armor and there's more armor sets inside of all the crowdfunding material as well now let's find out a little bit more about the quest we're about to go on within Massive Darkness 2. This one is the fourth one in, and this includes counting the tutorial as the very first one. This is called the Demon Artifact. It says here, the Infernal Realm is full of hidden artifacts steeped in the darkest of underworld powers. The one who wields the relic will command untold demonic power, but risk slowly transforming into a demon themselves. The quest objectives for this one is to complete the following objectives in order. The first thing to do is to gather the shards. There are three shards in the dungeon, and we'll specify which ones those are in a moment. Down below it then says to forge with Hellfire the three shards into an artifact in the Demonic Forge. The quest special rules here state in regards to the gathering of the shards that they are represented by the color side up objective tokens that are essentially in all three corners of this map. So you're going to try to pick these up and they're going to give five XP to the hero who does so and then we're going to forge with Hellfire when all the shards have been gathered if all heroes holding at least one shard or in the demonic forge zone represented by the gray objective token any hero in the same zone may spend an action to forge the artifact and that will conclude the scenario so that is our goal and that's what we're going after Here's an overview of the map that we are jumping into. You'll see the heroes right there in the center north of that middle tile, just in front of one of the doorways. Now that doorway leads right to the forge that we need to interact with at the very end. Once we pick up the three shards, you'll find shards on the left room far over here. Another shard way over here being guarded by what appears to be a gigantic monster breathing heavily through a grate, which looks absolutely awesome and terrifying at the same time. And then way up north, there's another colored objective as well so they're pulling us in all directions first to get all these shards and bring them back so we got a lot of movement to do Here's a close-up shot of the left-hand side of the game board. If you have a sharp eye, you'll notice I just switched out a door here. The only reason I did that is as part of the crowdfunding campaign, there were multiple different styles of doors that came along with the 3D doors pack. So what I've done is gone ahead and used only the demonic looking doors for the ones that lead to the shards. So that'll make things even more obvious as the rooms that are most important for objectives. The other doors that are more rounded on the top are simply just other chambers we can enter and potentially find loot or even something we've never seen before four up here with the anvil. Now when you run into these, these are actually considered a forge, and heroes can interact with a forge token, spending an MP on it as usual to interact. You perform a single craft in the forge, you can discard three item cards, and then draw one item card of a tier higher than that of the lowest tier of the discarded cards that you pile together. For example, if a hero discards an epic, two rare cards, then they draw an epic card. For the forge purposes, starting items and consumables are considered common. Heroes can spend multiple movement points in one action to craft multiple times. So you'll remember this mechanic within the original Massive Darkness, but now it's more of a limited thing instead of being an every single moment thing. As I alluded to earlier, there's also a number of upgrades for some of the different things you can interact with or things that can actually hurt you, like the spike trap up there to the north or the bear trap to the right. You'll remember the bear trap was a token in the tutorial because I was using the base game contents. Now I'm starting to mix more of the crowdfunding elements into the gameplay. It's also worth noting what's really cool about some of these that have effects on the bottom is there's stickers included with them to place on the bottom. So the bear trap here 
here, when you flip it over, will actually have the ability on the bottom of the miniature. So you don't need a token underneath of it. But one gigantic miss that I think they made was not actually placing stickers on the bottom of the chess. Those will still need a random token underneath. So I'll be placing one underneath all of the chests in play right now. There's only two of them. On this map, there is a large chest up here and a small one down here with tokens underneath. Now, just before we get started with the first round of play, there's something that could be easily missed when setting up your quest. If it's not the tutorial, be sure at the end of setup to check for any of these white icons present on the quest itself. It's gonna let you know to draw a level one to two mob for that location from the start of the game itself. This is an icon you will not see in the tutorial setup whatsoever. So it's very easy to think that that doesn't mean very much and you don't need to do anything about it. It does. In fact mean something make sure you get those mobs into play before you begin your first round I've gone ahead and pulled two mob cards and you'll see one of the mobs right to the right there. It is a mob full of the undead. And just below it is the infernal imps on the complete opposite side of the game board surrounding our heroes. Now I've gone ahead and pulled the one treasure token as indicated in the top left hand corner of both cards. For each of them from the treasure bag, it'll be a common item in the end for both of them. There are five rare tokens inside that treasure bag as well as a whole bunch of common ones. We didn't end up getting any rares this time, but maybe in the future we will. The mob item cards are level one to two because, well, we are in level one to two, just like the mob cards we pulled here. And that crossbow is going to go underneath the undead. So they now have the ability, the leader does, to attack from range or do melee attacks. The leader is said to be holding the item. And then down below for the infernal imps, they have stone knuckles, which I'll be using, giving them the ability to do melee attacks with a yellow die. And that's yellow all the way around for both mobs. The mob item cards have been slotted underneath the mobs, and now we'll take a look at the other set of enemies on the opposite side of the game board, the Infernal Imps. So as you can see, we have action on both sides of us now, making things quite interesting in terms of where we go to start things off. Mathurin the Wizard and Faye the Rogue are now ready to begin their quest. Let's start with the very first game round and we'll begin with Mathurin. Mathurin's first action is going to be to move two right into the spike trap. I think this is a good time to try this and hope that there's not a lot of damage that's coming towards him. Well, that didn't work out. I got two wounds right out of the gates for Mathurin. He has four health, so he's already down to half his health. Next up, I'm going to go ahead and actually use something that isn't in action with the wizard. And this is something I can do any time for one mana. I can turn this spell amulet clockwise to the next position. I'll do this two times in a row. So one, two to bring it to here and then pay another two mana on top of that. So a total of four to heal three to allow me to bring myself back up to full health. So I spent the four mana in order to do the movement to here, here, and then pay two to heal three, bringing me back up to full health, and my mana's down to just two. Also, when you use a spell on that final placement where I landed, it then rotates one more time afterwards. Now this is an interesting position for Mathurin to be in because I have two choices here. I could choose for my second action to go ahead and get two movement points in order to open up the door and then see what kind of mob is beside me there to the left in that chamber and then hopefully eventually get to the large chest in the back and there's also more treasure in there as well. Or I could say, forget that room. We're going to head north, go to the demonic door, head for the shard. Inside of this activation, I could open up either of those two doors and be able to do at least one attack action. If things got a little bit dicey, which it probably will because I'll probably run out of actions enough to do enough damage to kill the mobs, then I do still have Faye to come in and potentially provide backup if it gets nasty. So Mathurin is going to use a move action. He's going to crack open the door, and right now we're going to resolve a door card. Well, this is probably the coolest card I could have gotten. This is called the Warp Room. It says the active hero may choose another hero and place them on their zone, provided the other hero agrees. Well, if I'm playing solo, I get to decide, and I think it makes a lot of sense. First thing we're going to do now that we've got our two heroes right at the front of the door, we're going to resolve that mob and find out who it is. It appears we stumbled upon a mob of demons, and these demons are going to be at three health apiece. We also pulled a treasure token for the left-hand corner treasure icon. It was a common one. We're still hoping to see that rare in the future. For the mob item, they're holding a skeleton bane, or at least that's what the leader is holding. That'll be slotted under the mob card. 
Now, the demon mob is a pretty painful one, whether it's attacking or defending when it rolls the hand icon during combat, the hero is going to be discarding one mana. That can really be a problem, especially for Mathrin the Wizard. I'm going to burn away the other movement point. We're going to go right into an attack using the wooden staff. And on the wooden staff, I'll just show you, it is a yellow die and a magical weapon. So being that it's a magic weapon, it is able to attack either in the same space or one space away. So definitely within line of sight. And we're going to go ahead and roll one yellow die plus a shadow die, which is purple because we're standing in a shadow space. And then for the enemies, they are going to have a blue die for their leader. And then they're going to have a black die for each of the minions. And we're going to be rolling all of this together. It's also worth mentioning that I might have the ability, actually I do, if I want to spend one mana to reroll during combat. So that could be something that might be advantageous for me to do depending on how bad I roll here. Uh, oh my, that was really good. Okay, so we got ourselves a hand symbol, uh, no defense, and a lot of da enough damage to actually take out one of the minions. That was awesome. I'm going to choose to spend one of the two mana that Mathrin has in order to activate the combat reroll. You'll see it has to be done during combat. It costs one mana, allows me a reroll, and that reroll can be for any die, including any of the enemy dice. Definitely going to reroll that black die that I got. And then we're going to turn this amulet facing south. Now let's find out whether our reroll helps us out and gets rid of this hand icon we had to resolve. And no, it turns into a worse result for us. So one damage coming through to Mathrin. I've already removed it. We're down to three health. We now get to resolve our attack in terms of how many swords we got. We got three of them, which is enough to kill off one of the minions. So based on the three swords that we have right here and the three damage in the top right hand corner of the demon's card, we're able to kill off one of the minions and you always kill off the minions before the leader. So Mathrin, for killing off that miniature, and any miniature that gets killed off is always a guaranteed 1 XP, so we'll be going up by 1. Also, gaining a mana off of the yellow die and an additional mana off of his wooden staff. As you'll see over here, 1 XP, I went from 1 to 3 mana, and then over here is where that third mana came into play. When I do an attack, I get 1 mana just because of the wooden staff. This is why this weapon for Mathrin is really, really good, seeing as Mathrin uses a lot of mana with that spell amulet. It's also worth mentioning, just as an action in and of itself, Mathrin can go ahead and gain 3 mana if he gets into a crunch where he really needs a lot really quick. And at this point, that is going to end Mathrin's turn. I flipped over the activation marker. We're moving over to Faye. Faye's turn begins by pulling three of those tokens out of the Thieving Tools bag. And these are the three that I've received. Again, you don't have to resolve them in the order you pull them out of the bag. You have all three in front of you, and you can choose to use them as you take actions one at a time. All three that you get on your turn. So the movement here that we have isn't exactly the greatest time to get those, seeing as I'm mainly going to be focused on making attacks. But as you'll see, we do have one in there that allows me to add an additional yellow die, which can be really handy, especially seeing as I have a short bow, which already gives me a yellow die. So the first thing we're going to do is make an attack. So our dice pool has been assembled for Faye. We have a yellow die for the short bow from range, and we're making that ranged attack. We flipped over one of the tokens to add a yellow die, and we are in a shadow zone, so we get the purple one as well. The dice pool has been assembled. We can go ahead and roll. One thing you'll notice with this attack is we definitely have an advantage over them in terms of the number of dice we have in the pool because we thinned them out in the prior attack thanks to Mathrin. Going into phase turn here, there's one less minion, so there's only one black die in there representing the one minion left. So you can think of it like each of those minions have a black die and the leader has the defensive die. So here we go. Let's go ahead with the roll and see how this pans out we also have the ability to use phase abilities if we need to to maybe do some re-rolls we can spend a mana during combat to do one that could be handy so let's go ahead and see how this pans out we got ourselves one two three and two mana with absolutely no negatives whatsoever that was a beautiful roll 
However, I'm not satisfied because I've got a shadow die in there that only had one sword on it. So I picked it up, it's in my hand. I'm gonna go ahead and spend one mana as it depicts on Faye's character card as one of her abilities that she can use once during combat inside of an attack. She's gonna spend one of her three mana, dropping her down to two right now. And she's gonna reroll this purple die. And I'm hoping to do more damage than necessary to kill the minion and hopefully bleed over and hit the leader as well because there's no defenses this time around. So this is a good time to do that. Let's see if we can make that happen. No, and actually that was worse because we had one sword and we lost it. I took a gamble there, but you know, sometimes things don't work out even when you're a little bit uh, too daring. I'm not so sure that it was daring, but more so greed that might have led me to roll that uh, purple die. But hey, sometimes that will actually work out for you. Uh, I did gain a whole bunch of mana, so three mana coming to me. But again, I have a maximum of three with Phaedra right now. So she's now back up to her maximum. And the two damage that I did get from the dice here on screen, they've been placed on the mob card up top as I work my way up to a three threshold to kill off the minion. Again, Again, that was just the first action for Phaedra. So she's going to go ahead right now and make another attack. Now, the only downside with this is she's going to flip over one of her tokens and none of those are going to help with attacks. So you just pick one and flip it over and lose it. And this time around, our dice pool has gone down by one yellow die because, well, I had the advantage of that yellow die in the prior attack because of the token. I no longer have it. So we are going to go into this a little bit more even this time around. Probably shouldn't have been so greedy. Maybe I can make this happen. Oh my god, I'm getting so lucky with the defensive roll not landing anything, but my purple die is not helping me out. But that, that right there is really bad. So what I'm going to do right now is going to spend one of my mana here from Phaedra. So we're going to go ahead and just remove that, drop it down to two. I am definitely re-rolling that black die because that is a nasty combination that I don't want to see happen. Hopefully this comes back blank. Okay, and we have to revert that yellow die back to what it was. The black die ended up being a blank, which is exactly what we wanted. However, it knocked over my yellow die, so I've just placed it back to what it was. And we have one damage and two mana. So basically, I replenish the mana back for Phaedra. So she's back up to three. The one damage does get through, and that is enough to kill off the second minion, leaving just the leader. So you'll notice a couple of things here. We're back up to three mana. We got one XP for killing off the minion. The two hearts that were on the mob card way up there because of the additional one getting, going onto the card and hitting the three threshold have all been removed now because we killed off that minion. And now with the final action, which is gonna be a complete waste for this movement here, we're just gonna go ahead and do an attack, negating the fact we have that movement doesn't help us. It doesn't tie into what we're doing as an action. So in this case, we're gonna go ahead, roll the dice, but this time around, one less black dies. We just have the blue one in play and we're hoping for good things. Now, I don't expect to kill this thing off, but that purple die has a really powerful attack. If it lands, we could get lucky. So here we go. No, but we did get this shadow icon and I do technically have the ability to reroll if I don't like something and I don't necessarily like the shield but I may not like the shadow icon either. Now, what it states for Phaedra for the shadow icon is that you can draw another rogue token from your tools bag. So not really going to be helpful now at this point. That would have been a better thing to get earlier when I had other actions to use, and then I could have tied that into an action. I've already burnt all my actions at this point, so getting another token really isn't beneficial. So what I think I'm going to do it's gonna be risky. And we're gonna go ahead and spend one mana. I'm gonna roll that purple die. And I know I failed at this the first time, but we're gonna to try to see if we can pull this off the second time and maybe get past the defenses. Come on, three swords, where are you? Yeah, two will do. That's at least one damage going to the leader. All right, so a damage has been placed up on the mob card. I've also flipped over the activation marker for the rogue as both of our heroes have now fully activated. We now move into the enemy phase, which should be quite interesting with three separate mobs on the table, something we did not see in the tutorial. During the enemy phase, all the mobs get two actions when they activate, and you can choose which mob you want to activate. So the heroes collectively, if you're playing with multiple players, can decide which ones activate. Or if you're playing solo, you get the benefit of choosing that yourself strategically. For me right now, not much strategy. I might as well just go ahead and resolve the demon right here in front of me. This thing is going to be attacking me with a melee weapon, as you can see, underneath the demon mob card. So because of that attack type, it needs to move first, and whenever 
whenever something activates in terms of a mob on the enemy side of the equation, it gets two actions. So it might use it to just move twice. It might use it to move and attack. It might attack twice or it might attack and then move. So in this case, it needs to move to get in the same space as me. And then it's going to go ahead and hit me as hard as it possibly can. So the demon leader waltzes out the door into the same space as my two heroes and now I have to decide which of the two heroes is going to defend against this attack as both of them are in the same space. I'm going to choose to have Faye do this and there's another reason beyond the fact that Faye has five health and Mathur only has three right now and that is because I have the ability during combat to do a reroll. So if I really need to, I could spend mana during a combat in order to reroll a die and prevent something from happening. Happening. So that is within my power. Now, let's go ahead and roll these two dice. We are rolling them as a pool collectively because the actual demon has a melee weapon, which is yellow, and I have my battered leather armor on Phaedra as a blue die. And that's basically it. I have nothing else. So it's a die versus a die. Let's see how this goes. I might not even need to reroll. We'll see. Uh, oh, maybe I do. And again, the mana doesn't matter, but let's go ahead and spend the one mana on my side of the equation to reroll the blue die and hope that my armor does a much better job this time around. It's, yeah, there we go. So it's completely blocked and that combat is a wash for the demon. So Faye thematically dodges that attack from the demon leader and now another mob needs to activate. I'll choose the one over here in the top right hand corner. These are the infernal imps and they're basically not able to attack anybody currently. They have only melee type combat. They need to get in the same space. So they're going to activate and take two actions and move twice. So they are headed in our direction, but it is worth mentioning that enemies do not interact or flip over any kind of traps inside of the dungeon whatsoever. So those effects do not negatively impact the enemies. They're just there to mess around with the heroes. Now that's not all. On the far left hand side, we have an undead mob. Now this mob does have range, but thank goodness, based on the way the dungeon is laid out, there is a room right here. And regardless, they wouldn't be able to see me anyway because I'm kind of tucked up there a little bit further north from them, but uh, they can't just easily get to us. They're gonna have to kind of work their way through the dungeon to get to us. So they're gonna move two and they'll end up in the spike trap location. So that'll certainly be a future problem, but not something we need to worry about right away. The next phase is the level up phase. You take a look at the card in the bottom right hand corner for both your characters and you're looking at your XP as well to see how much you've accumulated to this point. And if you've hit the threshold for the next level, you must upgrade. You cannot delay on this. We don't currently have five XP to go to level two on either character. So we can just skip past the leveling phase completely. Moving into the darkness phase, we essentially look at this round tracker here and we'll be moving from one to two and you'll see just above it, there's no impact. There's nothing we need to resolve right now. Things are nice and peaceful, but there will be other things happening as we continue down the rounds. We'll talk about that later on. And also for those wondering around the rogue in terms of the tokens we flipped over on the last activation, the ones that are already used just stay in a discarded pile off to the side. And then of course, once the bag is completely empty, you'll replenish those tokens back into the bag. There is a rare case where there might not be any tokens in the bag and no tokens in the discard pile. In those cases you don't draw any additional tokens at all well because there isn't any the activation tokens for both heroes are placed back up on their blue side we now begin a brand new game round where we'll pick up the speed of things and again as always with every new round i can choose which hero begins I'm going to have the rogue activate first. So Faye, being in the same location as that final demon, is going to try and make an attack. And from the thieving tools bag, I pulled three tokens. The tokens are here in front of us. And I'm definitely going to use the additional yellow die as part of my first action in an attack. I've got the dice pool all assembled. We're using the short bow and we're using it as a melee attack in the same space, which is one yellow die plus a yellow die for flipping over the token from the thieving tools bag. One purple die for the shadow and the shadow area that we're currently standing in and one blue die for the leader, the last mob leader, the demon. We're going to go and try and clear off this mob and hopefully gain some stuff that is positive for us. And we got ourselves two swords, three swords, and one of the shadow icons, which allows me to draw another rogue token, which I am definitely going to do. So no rerolls necessary here. That is going to kill off the demon leader. The demon leader is now dead. That mob has been cleared. Let's go to the player boards, gain our XP, and then we'll walk through going after any loot. 
Now, based on the shadow ability here for Phaedra, because I got that shadow icon of a face, I get to draw a rogue token, as I mentioned. So we're gonna go into the bag here, draw one out. It's gonna give me an additional option to use during the leftover actions I still have. The one I got here is move up to two and then attack. That could be actually really handy for what I've got coming up in the near future. Also, Phaedra is gonna get one XP just for killing the one leader, but then both of the heroes are gonna go up by two XP because we killed a leader. So in the end, Phaedra is gonna end up at four and they're gonna have a plus two onto Mathrin, which is gonna bump him up to three. The mob leader was carrying a skeleton blade, which looks pretty awesome. Allows me to use a mana in order to heal one while doing a regular yellow die attack melee. But we also got a common item. So we're gonna grab a common treasure here from the deck and we got ourselves a longbow. That's pretty nice. So this is gonna be a nice upgrade from the short bow that I currently have. So checking out Phaedra's loadout, currently have the short bow. I'm gonna replace it with the long bow and we'll keep the skeleton blade in inventory on the side. It's also worth mentioning that the common treasure token goes back into the treasure bag. Phaedra's all squared away. We've only used one action. We still have two left to do. Let's decide what we do next. I can tell you right now, those infernal imps should probably be dealt with sooner rather than later. I just caught something that I missed doing when I opened up the chamber there to the left of our heroes. I, of course, went ahead and grabbed a door card and resolved that. Then I went ahead and spawned the mob inside the doorway, as I should. And then the third thing you're supposed to do, which I did forget, is you're supposed to resolve any treasure tokens that are in the room. You'll see one in the back corner there next to the chest. So we're going to grab a treasure token from the bag and replace it. I'm glad I caught that treasure token inside the chamber because when I grabbed a token out of the treasure bag, it ended up being a rare token, one of five inside that bag. So it is now placed inside that chamber, making it even more enticing to go in there. There's a large chest in there and that rare treasure. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have Phaedra head in there. One of my Thieving Tools tokens is a plus one movement point. So I'm gonna do some movement, add to it. Now I have three instead of just two. That will get Phaedra from where she currently is into the chamber and right in the same space as that rare item and the treasure chest. And we can choose which one we wanna interact with. Well, my friends, it looks like we found the mother load inside of this chamber. This is the chamber of rareness. That treasure chest has three rare items inside of it. What an absolutely massive haul this was. Grabbing three rare treasures. I've got myself on the far left-hand side, Leprechaun Slippers. These are gonna go obviously on my feet for Phaedra. And every single item you're seeing here is able to be equipped when we pick them up, which is insane. There's so much goodness across all these items. So the bottom here says defense three. So we can spend three mana when we're doing defense to take the attacking mobs item from them. That's pretty cool. And then the other one here says Heavy Gauntlets. Uh, that is gonna go in the ring slot and it's an attack one. You spend one mana during an attack and you gain two swords. That is a huge boost to attacks out of the gates without rolls even being part of the play. And then you have the actual body armor itself. That armor is gonna increase our typical battered leather armor for Phaedra from one blue die to three. That's gonna make a major impact going forward. I'm pretty sure that Phaedra's quite happy with what just happened and maybe it's justified seeing as she was able to take down the demon leader. She jumped in there and was able to accumulate all of those awesome items. Now that was a pretty impressive upgrade all the way around. Next up, we have another action to spend. I gotta choose which of these tokens I wanna use with it. I think I'm gonna use the move up to two and then attack. I think what I'm gonna do for my final action is to do a movement, so that's gonna give me two MP. And then after that, I'm gonna move up to two and then attack. All that combined will give me enough to get myself right near those imps to make a final attack after I grab the rare token left in the chamber. So the first MP is to go ahead and interact with that one rare token in the room. Flipping over a card here, we got ourselves Steel Gauntlets. Oh wow. This one here is an attack, one mana spend, and you get plus one yellow die. That's pretty good. Second movement point is to move into the adjacent area. And then of course now flipping of the token allows me to move two more and then attack, which is just enough movement to head out the door south. We'll turn, face the imps and make an attack. 
Phaedra is now within range to use her longbow, and that longbow is going to give her an ability to reroll once for free during the attack, thanks to it. That's pretty awesome. So we get a yellow die from the longbow itself, and we have the ability right now to spend a mana from the heavy gauntlets to add plus two swords as a result to the attack. So I'm definitely going to do that. I only have one mana left anyway, but that's going to really boost things up for me. Now looking across my other abilities, I could spend another mana to reroll, but now I don't have any left. So I do have one reroll but the combat reroll as part of my character's card i can't use that because i've just run out of mana so we're going to go ahead with the yellow die here knowing that we have the plus two swords going into it in terms of defense though the enemies here might have quite a bit so looking at them we're going to have a blue die and they're going to have two black dice and it does state on the imps card on defense if they roll one of the hand symbols they're going to kill one of the imps and then deal one wound to each hero in the attacker zone the good news is we're not in the same zone so that won't be so nasty okay Okay, here we go. Let's see how we do with this attack. This is the final action for Phaedra. Hopefully it's a good one. Okay, so we got an interesting roll here. Now I could, oops, I could go ahead and keep that hand symbol the way it was because it will deal a wound to Phaedra, which isn't all that much. I could handle one wound. I have five wounds total that I can take before I die with Phaedra. So maybe instead what I will do, and you also notice I don't have the shadow die in this equation because I'm not in a shadow space. So uh, it's kind of tough because re-rolling the die that I just rolled probably won't result in anything crazy. So maybe I should go ahead and use my free reroll to just get rid of that hand icon. And okay, well, it's stuck around anyway. So regardless, we are taking one wound, but one wound is getting through to the imps. So we'll place that on the mob card and then we gain a mana. So the imps do have one hit that got through. We reduced uh, Phaedra's health by one. And of course the leftover token, again, because we have an extra one, thanks to the ability to draw one from the shadow ability we got earlier, but we've run out of action. So we don't get to make use of it. So basically it's just burnt. These four tokens will go in the discard pile from the previous activation. And again, we'll continue to draw from the rogues bag as we go through activations until we run out of tokens to draw. And then we'll put them all back in and start another bag. So that is going to end Phaedra's turn. A pretty successful one overall and definitely geared up and ready to go. Let's start with Mathrin now. Activating Mathrin now has me with two trains of thought. One is I can move south into the same place with Phaedra and I can start making magic attacks into the adjacent area trying to kill off as much of the mob as I possibly can. Or I could do the exact same thing in terms of movement, but first before attacking, I could trade, gather some of the items from Phaedra to kind of bolster Mathrin who didn't get a chance to kind of bolster the equipment that he's carrying in order to help him with his attacks. And I think that actually might make more sense. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I know once we get to the dark darkness phase at the end of this round we are going to have a bunch of mobs spawning in all corners of this dungeon we're going to want to make sure our heroes are both ready to handle all of the insanity as it begins to close in on us so we're going to go ahead and have Mathrin activate using one well basically just one movement point to move south he'll burn his other movement point and then we'll use the second action to do a trading and equipping action out of all the cards between the two different heroes that can trade them, this is the one that he wants from Phaedra the most, so he's going to take this and equip it. Now I want to have Mathrin do a pretty powerful attack here. So what's going to happen is we're going to get our one yellow die for an attack with magic. Again, I can attack up to one space away. So that works range wise. So we have a yellow die in the fray. Um, in terms of the steel gauntlets, if I go ahead during attack and spend a mana, which I will, I gain another yellow die. So we'll do that. This is the reason why actually doing the trade action and burning one of those actions rather than attacking makes sense because now I got those gauntlets attached to my character but yet when I go in for just one attack with one action remaining, I'm using two yellow dice. If I hadn't have gone and gained the steel gauntlets, I would have been doing two back-to-back -back attacks with basically one yellow die in each of them. So this is a better setup or usage of my actions overall. And it also prepares me for whatever pain and suffering is coming down the line so I can try and handle it. Now, on top of all of this, my current spell amulet's pointing down to the fire course one, which I am going to do. It's an attack two. So if I spend two mana while I'm doing attack, so I'm burning every Every single bit of mana that I have because I'm going to go crazy here. This is going to add two swords into the pile plus the defender is going to take one of those fire conditions which will have it be rolling in the future to take damage which is great. 
Just before we go ahead and make our roll, the spell amulet has been turned because we went ahead with the fire course one. It rotates clockwise to the next spell. We're completely out of mana, but thanks to using the wooden staff here in the upcoming attack, I'll be able to gain a mana back. I've also off screen here placed one of the fire marker tokens on the mob card for the infernal imps because, well, as part of this spell, that is going to happen. The dice pool is now assembled. We are not in a shadow zone and we're rolling dice with no re-rolls whatsoever. So whatever happens, happens, which is a little bit scary. So we'll see if we do all right here. We do have two swords going in thanks to using the fire chorus one. So that's a plus. Uh, let's see how this roll goes. Oh, that's not bad actually. So we ended up getting two plus the two on the dice there for swords for us is pretty good. We have one defense to deal with, so it'll end up being three. First, we resolve the special dice anyway, so that hit is coming through. I can't do anything about it. So Mathrin's dropping from three health down to two, so he is down to half health, which isn't the greatest. And then we're gonna resolve our uh, swords, which I just mentioned was four. Take away the one shield there. Three going through. That is great. There's currently one hit already on the Infernal Imp. So basically the one hit will just stay on the card and we'll just have three go straight through. Kill off one of the minions. So Mathrin's going to increase his XP by one, which is great. And we also gain two mana out of it as well. So as I mentioned, Mathrin jumped up one XP and is now at four. We got two off the yellow dice for mana, but we also get a mana for using the wooden staff. So now we're back up to actual three, which is not bad. Again, we can't go any higher in our max, but it's six. We have lots of room there. And this is great because it gives me a lot to use. Going forward, we have used all three of Mathrin's actions now. We moved, we didn't really use all the movement points. Then we went ahead and traded, and then we attacked. So that's all three. At this point, this marker can flip flip over that turn for Mathrin is done. Moving on to the enemy phase, we get to choose which mob activates. And honestly, I kind of want to see what the Infernal Imps are going to do, seeing as they're on fire. So we're going to go ahead and roll a yellow die for that one fire condition token on it. We'll remove it right now. We're going to roll and hope to see as many swords as possible for additional damage here. Oh, that's the worst. Now the Infernal Imps have a melee type attack, so they need to be in the same space in order to do it. They're currently one away, so with the two actions that they have, one will be moving into the space with the heroes, and the second one will be attacking them. So as the Imps move into our space, we need to decide which hero is going to be taking the brunt of this attack. And honestly, based on the fact we have some seriously heavy armor on Phaedra, she is going to step up and take the hit. The dice pool's looking pretty blue, and that's because of the awesome armor that Phaedra has on. She also has those cool leprechaun slippers, which if she had three mana to spend, which she does not, she'd be able to literally take the item out from underneath of the leader, and that would certainly cap what it can do. It's worth mentioning, though, even when the leader doesn't have a weapon on them or equipped with them, they still have a default weapon, so they are still going to roll. So it is useful in certain situations, especially if they have a powerful weapon, especially one you could use against them would be kind of common. Uh, but in this particular case, it's not really going to help me to pull that away as the weapons I'm using are the same or better already. So we're going to go ahead anyway, roll these off and hope we defend against all the pain and suffering coming our way. Phaedra certainly has more ability to take damage and I might even need to use a health potion on Mathur in the future because he's getting close to death or maybe the spell amulet to heal. Future problems that I need to work out. Let's go ahead with this roll. Wow, okay, so I guess you need a lot more than three blue dice. Uh, we got two hits coming through. Now, the good news is that hand icon means nothing when the imps are on the attack. It's only when on defense they're going to go ahead and kill one of their imps off and hit us. So on the attack, that means nothing. We resolve that first, so that's a wash. Then two damage, minus one. So one is coming through to Phaedra. She did pretty good overall. So we'll go ahead and just remove one health from here. She's down to three. On the left-hand side of the game board, we have the Undead, which are still slowly creeping their way forward. They're going to get two actions, and both of them are going to be movement as they head into the area with that healing well. They're currently on their way, so we're going to have to keep an eye on that. They're approaching quite quickly, but I'm thinking I'm probably going to head north, which might distance myself, but we'll see. Things are about to get a little bit crazy. Moving into the level up phase, the saddest thing has happened. We are currently one XP away for both of our characters to level up. So unfortunately, we get to skip right past the level up phase. We don't have enough XP yet. I even did a double check on counting the XP to make sure I didn't miss any. And unfortunately, we just aren't there yet. But we go to the darkness phase now where we're going to move up the track. And as you'll notice, something is going to happen here above. Now, as if we didn't already have enough problems going on inside this dungeon being uh, attacked from all sides on the south, 
I thought the north was going to be clear, but that movement on the darkness track is going to have a roaming monster enter the fray, which lands on the purple spawn way up top in the north there. So we're drawing a card from the level one to two deck as our heroes have not got past level one yet. Let's go ahead and find out what gigantic monstrosity is coming our way. Well, this looks absolutely terrifying. We have the ghoul that's shown up way up north. The ghoul is the roaming monster that's coming in from the north. This thing looks pretty intimidating. We have a health of five per hero, so 10 health. It's going to have two treasure tokens placed on it. It has one fixed treasure token on it, which is rare. You'll see there for defense, it has two blue dice and one black die. And then when it's on the offensive, it is a melee attack with an orange die and a black die. And of course, the abilities in terms of when it activates, all in the middle there. Now, just before I go ahead and place those treasure tokens on the card, I want to show you it closer up so you can read the wonderful stuff that could potentially happen when this thing activates. And again, it will activate by going through the bullet points until it does one of them. And once it does one of them, that's the end. And if it doesn't do either of the two that are listed here, well, then it defaults to what a regular mob would get, which is just two actions to use, whether it be moving, moving, or move, attack, or attack, move, or attack, attack. So in this case here, these two things that could happen depending on whether they trigger There's one at the very top says if there is a minion in the ghoul zone you kill the minion in the zone the players get to choose which minion dies and then the ghoul heals by five so this thing is a nightmare when it gets close to any other mobs with minions that is bad so we probably, probably want to take this thing out when it's way up north where there's no other mobs present so we're going to need to keep separation there below it says otherwise the ghoul moves three zones towards the closest hero and attacks when possible so the unfortunate thing is if that doesn't happen it moves extremely fast and likely to try and get into a position where it can and in the future try to use that top one again so that is pretty nasty now below it says in combat when it gets one of those hand icons you're going to move the closest mob one zone towards the ghoul so it's also attracting them wow this thing is really nasty I'm going to have Mathfrin to start this round off, and I love the fact that Spellman is already pointing at this attack here. We can spend one mana to add plus one sword into the fray. I'm going to do that, so that's a mana for that. We'll just place it there just to say we're spending it. Of course, I'm going to rotate this spell amulet up to the top, and that's going to get me closer to the heal, which I definitely need to do. And then this mana here, I'm going to use when attacking to gain another yellow die. So we already have one yellow thanks to the wooden staff, another yellow thanks to the gauntlets, and then this is going to give us one sword right out of the gates. We're going to go into an attack, and then after the attack, I'll gain a mana back, giving me two, which I can then use to do some healing. Now I need to hope, pray, cross my fingers that I'm able to take this attack attack without taking too much damage because I am at risk of potentially dying. There is one minion die which could mess with me but it shouldn't be enough to kill me. Now on defense here I really don't want to see the hand symbol. That would be really bad because it would kill off one of the minions and deal a wound to me and that's not good. I'm trying to keep myself up in health but hey if it happens I could handle that one thing happening. So let's go ahead and roll these dice. I don't have any re-rolls into this. I do have the one sword already. We'll see if we can add to that. And I do have one damage already on the mob card, so that helps with hopefully getting this other minion out of this mob. Oh my gosh, what a crazy roll that was. And that one, we'll say, landed on the two shields. It was just a bit cocked, but we'll say that that was valid. That's bad. So we don't have the ability to re-roll that, unfortunately. I'm just doing a quick look here to make 100% certain. Yes. So we are going to take one wound, so Mathurin's going to drop down to one health, which is dangerously low, and I do not like that at all. And then when we did our attack, we have one sword, plus the three is four. Two of them were defended against. Two of them go through and hit the minion. We already have one on the minion, so that's three. It will kill the minion off, so that's good news. So Mathurin did his job on that attack, that attack successfully killing off the minion. Let's take a look at the character board and see what's changed. As I mentioned earlier, after using this spell here, the spell amulet automatically rotates over. We gain one XP for killing off that minion, bringing us to five, which means we'll be able to level up in the level up phase coming up here for Mathroom, which is great. We also get an additional mana here, thanks to using the wooden staff, which brings that back. And actually, as an action right now, I'm gonna go ahead and spend two mana in order to heal three, because it's perfect. It'll allow me to use the full allotment of that healing to bring him back up to four. 
Now for my second action with Mathrin, I'm gonna go ahead and use his actual ability on his character card for the first time. He has no mana left. I'm gonna use that action to replenish three mana, so we can now go into a third action where I'm gonna make an attack, and I'll spend some of this mana in order to try and bolster it. So the first we're gonna use is gonna be in order to use the combat here for one mana, giving me one reroll, which is awesome. So we'll go ahead and spin that down to here. This is gonna get knocked down to two mana, and then I'm literally gonna go ahead and spend another mana here in order to gain a yellow die. So we're going in with one yellow, another yellow. We have a reroll, and we know we're going up against just the leader now, so it's only going to be a blue die. Plus, at the end of this attack, we're also going to be able to gain a mana back. All right, let's see how this pans out. Hopefully for good things. I'd love to get something extra here from the imps in order to add to Mathrin. He hasn't gotten too much treasure, so we kind of deserve something. Let's see how this goes. Oh, not bad, not bad. Okay, so it's not exactly what I wanted, but here's the good news. I could choose to re-roll. Now, what are my odds of actually getting a double sword? Just one side with a double sword. That is pretty risky. Huh. Is it worth it? I mean, I'm not gonna be able to kill it. I kind of want to try. <laughs> Don't know if this is a good idea or not. Let's do it. Let's risk it. I mean, it's worked for me in the past, right? No, it hasn't actually ever worked for me in the past. Okay, here we go. Let's roll. Let's just make it happen. Come on, two swords. Give me that kill. Oh, but it gave me an additional mana. So I guess in the end it worked out for the better. Matherin tried his absolute best, but still wasn't able to pull it off. I've gone ahead and placed the two damage up on the M card, which is really just the leader at this point, and we gain our one mana from the staff. That is going to end Matherin's activation. He at least is in a good spot with his health, and he doesn't feel so scared anymore. Activating the rogue here, I've got three tokens pulled, one movement point, two reroll tokens, and with two rerolls inside of each of those tokens, that is really cool, and I'm looking already at the potential of running towards that gigantic roaming monster, but the thing is, even if I tried to use an action to move with two movement points and then flip this over to get three, I'd only be able to get in a diagonal angle. I'd be in a dark space there. I'd just go one, two, three up, and it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to pull off any kind of attack yet, so I'd really be just putting myself in harm's way for no real gain. Um, I could run right for that north door where the shard is, but if I crack that open, there is a mob that's gonna spawn behind that door, and adding a mob into the fray with that thing in the uh, court or I should yeah in the corridor it's a recipe for disaster for me so that is not a good idea what I could do is just try and take out the final infernal imp the leader here in front of us and then maybe try to focus on the undead and shuffle over and do that because then I could use those rerolls to my advantage or I could also and this is something I haven't talked about before I'm in a space right now with that leader that imp leader and if I want to just leave the space you can always move out of a space when you're in combat but you will suffer a wound for every single miniature in that space as an enemy so I could run away but I'm going to take a hit now that, does, that sounds bad I've got three health with uh, Faye right now but I do have a health potion so if I needed a quick boost I could drink it I've decided to have Phaedra make a melee attack in the same space with her longbow. She is able to make that melee attack with one yellow die. I'm also going to be flipping over this token here to give me two rerolls as part of that attack. Is there anything else I want to add into this? I could get an additional reroll if I want to pay for it. I probably want to just use my heavy gauntlets to make sure that this actually lands. But I don't have any mana. That's another problem. So maybe I won't. So really this will be a yellow die up against a blue die and nothing else. I'm not in the shadow zone. I'm not gonna add anything else in the fray, but I do have re-rolls and I'm hoping, 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 hoping I can re-roll myself into a situation where I kill it. I already have two damage on this leader. So I only need one to get through. So here's hoping I can make this happen. So here we go. Hey, look at that, right out of the gates. No need for rerolls. We got what we needed. That thing is dead, and the reroll token that I have here is completely useless. Um, I mean, I don't need it at all. So Phaedra, for killing off the imp leader, is gonna go up by one for killing one miniature in the game world, but then by two because it was a leader as well. And that additional two will also go up on Mathrim because a leader was killed. So he, they're both gonna go up to seven total, which is really, really good. The item that I end up getting off the mob card is Stone Knuckles. I'll be placing this inside of Phaedra's inventory. I don't think I'll be equipping this one, but potentially could use it at one of the forges later on to maybe upgrade something. But I do also get a common treasure based on this token here. That token will go back in the treasure bag. The card that I pulled is an interesting one. This one's called Ring Blade. It says attack. If you kill the leader, perform a free attack action. That's actually pretty cool. 
Next up, I'm gonna go ahead and do some movement. I'm not gonna use this token, the plus one movement for any real benefit because I'm only gonna move two spaces to the west and not go any further. I'll use my longbow as an attack action for the last action. The good news is that now I'm in the shadows and for my third and final action, I'll definitely be using this token right here to get some re-rolls. So we'll be flipping that over. We're gonna get all our dice pool assembled and see how much damage we can do here. All right, let's see how we do. We do have those two re-rolls, which should certainly come in handy. There is a lot of enemy dice in this pile here. This is a fresh mob we're going after. Oh, that's a good roll. That's a very, very good roll and a really poor roll by the enemy, which is awesome. So what I'm gonna do is I'm definitely gonna use one of the re-rolls to try to get rid of that black hand icon. Now, what happens in this case? Now, actually the undead have an ability that only triggers on their attack. So the hand icon means nothing. So I'll actually leave that because it doesn't actually do any damage to me whatsoever. And maybe I'll re-roll this other yellow die and just hope to get two swords on it. I'm being a bit greedy here. I don't really need that. So hopefully I don't uh, mess myself over here. I could also try to roll this to get three swords, but that's just being extra greedy. I don't think that's gonna happen. So the question is, do I just stay with where I'm at? Let's do that. Let's just stay where I'm at to guarantee I can kill one minion. So overall, not bad. That is gonna be it for my activation. I don't have any other actions to spend. I was able to thin it a little bit with the longbow shot, but that's gonna do it. So we'll flip over the activation marker. We're now going to move into the enemy phase. Moving into the enemy phase, it's always wise to take a look at how each of the enemies are gonna activate and how choosing one to go before the other could impact how badly you get affected because you do get the choice to activate in any order you wish. Now with the ghoul here being so far away, I feel pretty confident we're safe here. Looking through the two bulleted points here, neither of them can be done. The first one for sure, there is no minion in the ghoul zone, so that one cannot be done. The next one below says otherwise, the ghoul moves three zones towards the closest hero and attacks them if possible but there isn't a hero within three zones so it can't get to a hero to attack them so it can't do that one either and in that case it's going to be treated like a mob where it just gets two actions so it'll essentially just be running down the corridor two spaces the fact it's on its way down to me is terrifying enough. I don't need to deal with anything else around this roaming monster currently. Let's check out the undead as they definitely want to attack. So taking a look at the undead mob here, you'll see down below it has two attack types. It has range and it has melee. So really this thing's quite versatile in terms of how it can attack. We know a range type attack can basically draw a line of sight orthogonally in any direction so long as doors and walls don't block it. Heroes and any other uh, enemies do not block line of sight. And of course you can't draw line of sight diagonally. So in this case, they have no problem staying still and just rolling a yellow die for a ranged attack. So they're gonna have that for the lead is a yellow die. They're going to get one for the minion. So that'll be these two dice building out their pool. They also have an ability on their card that says if they roll the hand icon on the enemy black die, then they're going to add a yellow die into the fray and the mob in general is going to take two wounds. So they are going to just keep on coming with the pain, but they're also kind of hurting themselves at the same time. Now I have to say that I was really lucky to find this armor because this armor is probably keeping my entire party alive in general because Phaedra is able to get herself in situations that are pretty nasty and otherwise would be pretty bad. But having the three blue dice is very handy so long as I can actually roll shields, which I haven't really been able to do yet, but you can see there are some pretty good results in them if you actually land them. So here we go with this roll. Now I do have the ability again to spend mana to get a reroll, but I still haven't generated any mana for Phaedra, I really probably should use an action to do some resting, essentially allowing me to get some health or mana back. That would probably be wise. I haven't done that yet because I've been a little bit more proactive in my attacking and moving. Let's see how much pain is coming my way here. Hopefully the blue dice are gonna save me. All right. Oh, that's not bad at all. So we actually ended up getting a great roll here and uh, the attack that comes towards us gets completely blocked and the man, of course, isn't gained by the mob. So that is going to resolve one attack, but we're not out of the woods yet. There's going to be two attacks coming our way because they didn't have to move. So we got to do this again and cross our fingers so this doesn't get worse. Okay, not bad at all. See, those shields are starting to show up. 
We now head into the level up phase, which is way more exciting this time around because we actually have XP to spend. We have seven. We paid the actual cost of the next level, which is five in full, dropping us from seven down to two. This will happen on both characters. I'll just show you one side to start. We move this peg up to level number two and a couple things happen. First off here, we're gonna gain an HP. So our total maximum health has gone up beyond the four we have here. We have an additional one. And when we gain health this way, we actually get that health right away on our character. So so we're gonna jump up to five for Mathurin, which is definitely good because he's been on the ropes a couple times. Then you'll see a token beside it for treasure. You'll see four of them along the way. That's the four tokens you place next to your uh, character when you're in setups. So you'll grab that token. You're gonna to place that inside the treasure bag. That's gonna have an immediate impact on just the ratio of rare treasure inside the bag. And eventually you'll get to the epic treasure later on. On the rogue side of the equation, I was able to also level up, of course. This individual had eight XP, so drops down to three. Had a little bit extra on Mathern, did a little extra work overall. And we took the uh, rare token, placed that in the treasure bag as well, and then jumped up health from three to four. Again, we can go to a maximum of five with this character. Actually, I should say five plus one is six. But again, we'd already taken some hits. As part of the level up, Mathurin gets to choose a brand new skill card. Keep an eye on these cards to make sure you're only uh, pulling in the ones to choose from that are from the level you've acquired and lower. And you can see that there in the black border. So we only have level twos and level ones available. Also keep an eye on the Roman numerals at the very top because if you start seeing twos and threes, you need to make sure you have the prior durations of that spell to go to that second, third, fourth level, that kind of thing. So in this case, they're all ones, so we're fine. So any of these are options. And honestly, across all of them, there's great reasoning as to why I should pick certain ones but the one I'm eyeing the most and I think will help us with that roaming monster and maybe future ones that come out would be this dark magic card and I believe I might have picked this up in the tutorial but I can't remember I don't think I had a chance to use it though uh, but this one looks really good especially if we can get that roaming monster the the uh, ghoul down to a low level of health I can spend a mana to take two wounds which hurts me but my health is a little bit up higher than it was before and then I can deal three wounds to any enemy in the dungeon which is extremely powerful and could be what I need to kind of push through a barrier and be able to kill it off. So we're going to go ahead and take dark magic, slot it into the amulet. Now when you acquire a new skill, you're gonna place it in the amulet and of course it's gonna cover up one of the more basic ones that are on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover up this one. And just like that, Matherin's all set up. And again, I believe this was the same layout I had in the tutorial, but now we'll have more time to explore what this actually does. Taking a look at the rogue cards here, we have four very interesting ones. Two, again, coming back when we picked one from the very beginning. These will add shadow tokens or poison tokens, both of which are valid options and will provide a lot of advantages. The two new ones here I'll focus on for now. The one right here is some tricks. At the start of your turn, you may rotate this card to exhaust it, place back the tokens you drew, and draw three new tokens. Refresh this card when reshuffling the bag. So you have to wait for a while to be able to reuse this one again, but it would help you maybe get out of a jam of getting a bunch of tokens that aren't useful for a given turn so that's kind of nice is a nice trick the other one that's really cool looking too is the toolkit one this one says at the start of your turn you may add a random face up spike trap to a zone in range zero two if possible this trap only affects enemies the trap damage is times two and then as an action you can move yourself to a trap up to one zone away and remove it without suffering its effect that could be really handy seeing as we still have a trap in play block blocking one of the doors. Actually, we have two traps in play blocking doors close by. So I think the toolkit is the one I absolutely should go for. Heading into the darkness phase, this one's quite easy. We're moving on and that's gonna be an additional rare treasure token being added to the treasure bag. Now it's worth mentioning in future rounds here, we have some scary stuff coming up. We're gonna have a mob spawn at the end of the next round and that is going to place mobs at all three portals in the game, which is gonna be north, west, and east. That's gonna have a whole bunch more enemies show up while we're still trying to go after these shards of which we still have zero. We're just trying to work through the center of the game board right now and clear a path and try to determine which one to go for. I was originally going north, but the roaming monster showed up there, so that changed that whole situation. And now with the ability with my rogue to potentially get rid of a trap, we could head over to the east because that is very, very clear right now. And that's maybe where I should head or we could go west and try to deal with the rest of the undead. There's choices to be made. 
With the rare treasure token now inside of the treasure bag, we are going to wrap up part number one with the activation tokens coming back up for a brand new round in the next video. Now, there's something in the comments I want to ask all of you guys. Two questions, actually. The first one is, should we keep the party together? They seem to be working well together. And if that's the case, which shard should we focus on right now? The east one is wide open. Now, remember, behind each of the demonic doors that hold a shard, there is a mob inside each of those chambers. So regardless of the corridors being clear to those chambers, once we get inside of them, there will be enemies. So remember that. But let me know in the comments which one of the shards we should go to first if we're sticking together as an actual group. Now, a second question is, should we split the party? There might be interest in actually having the characters go separate ways to accomplish grabbing multiple shards a little quicker, but it could also put us into a more dangerous situation where we could end up losing a life. We only have one life bringer token, so we can only afford to die once over. And then after that, if we die one more time, well, that is going to be a failure. So we need to think strategically here, and I would love to hear your comments down below on what we should do either way. Thank you guys so much for watching. Having a blast playing through this one really looking forward to all the feedback and i'll see you in the next episode and as always keep on rolling solo